Does your vagus nerve need more compassion? Well, in this episode, we're going to find out. But first, I have something to show my dearest Amy. And I thought that this was perfect for today's topic. My t-shirt wins the t-shirts of the universe contest today. Please note the less (laughs) haters, more taters t-shirt. I love it. I love it. My shirt's very sad because... It's a Fleetwoods Fleetwoods on Front Street shirt, and it got destroyed in the Lahana fire in Hawaii. So my oh, your no. shirt, your shirt is a very amazing, very upbeat shirt. My shirt was a lovely place. We went there on our honeymoon. Um, one of the the drummer in Fleetwood Mac owns the restaurant. Okay, but it got burnt down. Oh, <laughs> so well, <laughs> this is quite the intro to the episode. I know. I know, <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I saw this t-shirt on an Instagram reel ad and it called to me. So I, I had to purchase it. I like it. it. It's really yeah. amazing. It's I like how, I like how strong the potato is. Yes. It kind of reminds me of that like Trogdor beefy arm yeah. that we talked about many episodes ago. Uh, hmm. Anyhow, let's get into the topic of compassion, both self-compassion and compassion for others and the world around you. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us, oh, dietitian of mine, why should we care? <laughs> why can't we just go around being a big old negative Nancy nasty person? Why or why can't we go around beating ourselves up and being nasty to ourselves? What does this have to do with anything? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. Um, you know, the the more I've dug into work on my book, the more I focus on mindset and things like compassion because they sent, they tend to be bigger deal breakers than, you know, being on the right supplements and all these things that are touted and promoted. It seems like self-compassion and your mindset and elements of your mental health, that kind of stuff seem to be huge deal breakers and the corners are often cut or just they're not discussed. Like, I don't think self-compassion is really discussed in the IBS space hardly at all, or compassion in general isn't discussed. Um, But I think it's incredibly pivotal. And I do think some people are better at being compassionate towards others, whether they're practicing the skill right now than themselves. And so, um, that's just something to consider. Um, I think a lot of times too, when you're so focused on gut health stuff and having the right diet and, um, being really rigid and perfectionistic about supplements and things like that, that you're doing things like compassion for others, just kind of like you're, you're trying to, to move forward with this, um, goal for yourself that sometimes like, oh, I'm not necessarily going to engage with others as much. So there's less room for compassion, I think, a lot of times. And then I actually think a lot of the the gut healing stuff can actually be pretty judgy and not very compassionate Huge. to your body. Yeah. So you're not really taking you into the carbs? elements. Right. God, what a kind of a garbage human being are you? Why would you poison yourself with carbs? Yeah, there's a lot of judgment and shame. Right. And, and there's a lot of, I I think too, another element of the compassion angle with IBS is I do think a lot of IBS patients have some shame and judgment around their symptoms too. Um, so like if they had diarrhea or something, they would feel shameful to, to poop in public. Um, or again, like to have gross farts and no one wants these things, you know what I mean? But obviously, you know, gross gas, that kind of stuff. Like they're not necessarily like pleasant experiences for everybody if they happen, but the way you're approaching those situations if from a compassionate lens or kind of like a judgy or like, I need to change this situation lens can really affect how you progress through your journey. And so it's just, I think this is a really very, actually very important topic. Um, can I add something Yeah. Now? Go ahead. And hopefully we haven't lost people in the first four and whatever minutes here, because what I was actually fishing for when I asked the question, and you made great points, I'm going to say that, but what I was fishing for is that there's research that says that the vagus nerve is stimulated by compassion. 
So here are all of these people who are trying to increase their stomach acid, increase their Mm -hmm. bile flow, increase their pancreatic juice secretion, heal leaky gut, decrease their liver enzymes, decrease their inflammatory markers. And it's like one of the, one of the big keys to that could be compassion in an indirect way because compassion is going to stimulate the vagus nerve for free too. Like no fancy supplements or blends or essential oils needed, right? No gadgets, no electrodes on your neck or whatever it might be. Like you can stimulate your vagus nerve and therefore dramatically, dramatically impact the health and the function of your gut with compassion both for yourself and for others and the world around you. So that's what I was fishing for. But you made a lot of really excellent points and showed us that the people listening at home probably could use more compassion in their life. And that a lot of the journey that they've been on probably has reduced the compassion in their life. Yeah, 100%. And and I will say too, thinking about typically, and this is in the research too, when someone has IBS, typically IBS patients, I can't say all, but typically in the research, it shows that there seems to be a heightened threat appraisal when symptoms come up, which basically means like you you might have a more of a stress reaction when your symptoms come up. Fight um, or flight. Yeah, fight or flighty. So think about that. So you're kind of put on guard when symptoms come up. Um, and that again, when that comes up, a lot of times it can make you want to like, oh, I have to change things or I like this needs to, I need to figure out what to do right here, right now to change the situation. Or I need to kind of put together a new protocol because I'm having more bloating today. And and so there's a lot more urgency around those types of reactions. Whereas I feel like um, where self-compassion can be really helpful is that it allows you to kind of accept the ebbs and flows of how your symptoms change across time because no strategy is really going to work within a day or like, you know, right here, right now for IBS. Long-term strategies take time to kind of weave in and out. So self-compassion sort of takes into account that there's going to be ebbs and flows in how you're feeling and that's okay. We don't know necessarily have to change things that come up or symptoms that come up from a day-to-day standpoint. Um, And again, it's kind of a tricky topic because sometimes people are like, oh, you're just saying like, I shouldn't care about symptoms. And it's like, no, that's not really what I'm saying. It's more so if you can, um, you know, accept that the symptoms are not going to change overnight (laughs) and just kind of allow the discomfort to be there for now. You can still acknowledge that it sucks. Right. Acknowledge that it sucks. You know, give yourself compassion along the way. I think super helpful. Um, But at the same time, you know, a long term mindset, like you have to weave in good nutrition and you have to weave in movement and stress management. That takes time. It's not like an overnight shift. So there's going to be these ebbs and flows and it's not going to be a week or two. Uh, process to get symptoms under control. Uh, There can be things that could greatly reduce them more quickly, but realistically, like typically long-term IBS relief takes time. Um, But yeah, I think that self-compassion can help, can help you deal with how you're reacting to the symptoms in a much more, um, you know, balanced way so that it's not preventing progress. Because if every time symptoms come up, you're jumping into a fight or flight state, um, that's not really going to serve you super well long term. And I I have a thought on that. But first, I just realized we did it again. We got nine and a half minutes. Define self-compassion or compassion. We got nine and a half minutes in and we have yet to define compassion. So I have one pulled up from a research article. So I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, This is the quote. It says, as a health promoting affect, compassion is defined as a deep awareness of others suffering, followed by a desire to alleviate it and provide care, as well as an understanding without judgment or pity. So it's kind of related to empathy 
I think it's it's in that same like ball of wax. But now that I've shared that, to piggyback off of what you were just saying, and I, I'm going to flesh can that I, out. Can a bit. I share another uh, definition oh, yeah. too? Just because I it, it's a little bit less sciency. It might. Uh, but this is for self-compassion specifically. Yours was talking more compassion broadly. Yeah. Um, but this is from Kristen Neff's website. Her website's really great. Um, I'm going to be referring to like her a lot through this conversation. But she writes, self-compassion simply involves doing a U-turn and giving yourself the same compassion you'd naturally show a friend when you're struggling or feeling badly about yourself. It means being supportive when you're facing a life challenge, feeling inadequate or or when you make a mistake, instead of just ignoring your pain with a stiff upper lip mentality or getting carried away by your negative thoughts and emotions, you stop to tell yourself, this is really difficult right now. And how could I comfort and care for myself in this moment? I really That's like a really that. good definition. Yeah. And I really like the question at the end of like, okay, how can I like care for myself in this moment is such a mm. great question. Um, to ask when you're struggling with different things or struggling with symptoms, like, and again, I think it, it can be as simple as just saying like, wow, this sucks right now. Or, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this right now and kind of acknowledging and giving yourself some kindness. But I thought that that was a really good definition. I want to see yeah, um, if there's anything, um, well, that, that gives us something to go off of in the meantime, but um, I'll throw this out there too. One possible lens that you could see this through is like, is what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're thinking helping the situation or hindering it? So I'll give an example. Because um, actually this, this, I had mentioned this before we stepped on that I had a recent non-medical related example of this in my own life. And it took somebody else pointing this out to me to realize it was self-compassion, what I was doing. Um, so I recently got hearing aids. I told you that. Uh, the the people at home don't know, but I recently got hearing aids. And um, last week, I picked up the hearing aids Monday morning, and I, I started wearing them Monday around lunchtime. And I had this grand vision for my work week, Right, like I, I had some recording and filming I was going to do, some research, some emails. Like I had all of these things slated for my work week, but I ran into a little bit of difficulty, and I think I shared this with you on Marco Polo that I, I'm hearing things louder now, and I'm hearing a lot of background noises that I wasn't aware of before, mm. and I felt like my brain, my nervous system was very overstimulated, and I just was really dragging last week. So, you know, I go into the work week thinking, oh, I'm going to do all this filming and all this research and it's going to be a super productive work week. And man, no exaggeration. I, it was like my brain just kind of throttled down a couple of notches. I took a nap on the floor of my office. That's yeah. my hack. But remember a couple episodes ago, we talked about how you can lay down for half an hour and then you feel all refreshed. And I was like, no, if I lay down, I'm taking a three hour nap. <laughs> My hack is that sometimes I'll lay on the yoga mat on my floor in my office if I just want to limit myself to a quick nap. So I have to make sure it's not too comfortable. Right. <laughs> but like I took it, I took like an hour and a half long nap on the floor of my office one day and I really did, I didn't get any filming done. I tried to film two YouTube videos and they were garbage and I'm going to delete them and I have to re-record them anyway because I was trying to push through. But I, you know, I... I got to maybe Monday evening and I realized what was happening. And I was like, ooh, yeah, I think that my brain's confused and overstimulated by all of this mm. new information. And so I tried to initially push through on Monday and do the filming and get things done. Mm. And then basically Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I kind of surrendered to it. And I was like, you know what? This sucks. Like, I wanted to be more productive. I wanted to get some more YouTube videos filmed. I wanted to make the most of this time that I had this week. But it is what it is. And my my nervous system is dealing with something right now. And I've just got to give myself the space and the time to deal. And so when I felt like I could do some work, I just watched, like, some recorded lectures and some webinars. Yeah. And I I just got to be kind of passive and be a student and become a sponge as opposed to me trying to produce something and me being productive. 
But I was telling that to a psychologist friend of mine, and she immediately applauded me and said, oh, that was a great example of self-compassion. Like, you acknowledged that sucks. I wanted to be more productive, and I had a to-do list this week. Hmm. But it is what it is, and you gave yourself the time and the space to adjust to what you were dealing with. And I was like, oh, yeah, go be self-compassionate one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, similarly, would it have made sense to force myself to work really hard and churn out subpar videos or subpar work and, and like force it? And similarly, if there's something in your life that you're not being very self-compassionate about, is it helpful to have that mean bullyish inner dialogue? Does it actually help you achieve your goals? Does it actually further what mm. you're trying to do? Or does it just make you feel icky and shameful and, and blah, and actually sabotage your goals? So that's maybe one barometer that you could use is like, mm. is, is this thought or is this action actually helping or no? Yeah, it's such a good story. You know, one other I forget where I read it. It might have been in an article or something, but they said um, self-compassion is the why behind self-care. So like if you're not being kind to yourself or that you don't see yourself as worth it, it's really hard to do self-care activities. So that's also maybe another barometer if you're someone that really struggles with pulling away from work or doing things for yourself um, when you need a break or kind of gauging what you're, what you need in the moment, I think that that's another maybe sign that you could working on self-compassion might be really helpful for you. Um, because I think it would help you be able to fill your needs and do self-care and, and those kinds of things. Um, it's funny you say that because I have some students, one in particular in FODMAP Freedom right now that really comes to mind. And, it's, I think we're going to get her there, but every week of the Q and A's, it's, I'm kind of checking in on her about, Hey, are you, are you making some time for self-care mm -hmm. and hobbies and, you know, time for yourself or doing something fun. And, um, I think that she's definitely somebody who has been affected by stress and trauma and low vagal tone. And I think that's a big driver in her symptoms. But yeah, it's, I like that phrasing that self-compassion is the why behind self-care. Yeah. And, and one other thing that comes to mind too is like maybe you're not necessarily like judging yourself per se. I think a lot of people in the IBS space like judge their gut and everything that's going on in their gut. Like they're so kind of judgy in a weird way and sort of more gut directed, I would say, than yeah, like beating like my themselves gut has up. one job and it's not doing it. Right. Yeah. Like why can't my gut work? Like that kind of stuff. I think that that also is an area that, you know, encompasses the self-compassion element that is maybe a little bit, um, I, I don't know. It's not really talked about in the self-compassion world, but I think specifically for IBS patients, if you're constantly judging everything that's happening, gut wise as good or bad, then, you know, the, it's like, you're kind of judging the body necessarily judging your body so harshly, um, and its ability to digest. I think that that really holds people back too. Yeah, I agree. And also I'm going to throw this out there. I kind of disagree in a way though. Okay. The Tell first me. part of your statement to let it be known that in episode 173, <laughs> We finally disagreed on something. Not really, though. Well, I'm just let's, add see. To it. let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's, let's see because let's I'll see. probably end up agreeing with you. Yeah, I think I'm just going to add something. So yes. you started that chunk of information saying that people don't necessarily like judge or speak harshly to themselves. I disagree in some instances. For example, the person who took PPIs and then they developed bloating or SIBO yes. and they think that that was a root cause huge problem in that group of people. Oh my well, God, and I, I shouldn't have done it. I gave myself SIBO. I, I'm such I a would, bonehead. I would say to clarify, I agree. I'm saying there's some people that are not like outright bullying like their decisions or or like themselves personally. It's It feels more like body reactions that they're judging versus yeah. 
you know, I made a shitty decision or something like that. That's kind of more judging their decision making or their that kind of thing. It's it feels more like body directed, which might be not necessarily the most obvious. Yeah. Like, and I, oh, I'm judgy or shamey towards my body. Some people be like, oh, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't sound like me. But when you think about it through the lens of like judging your sensations or being really hyper vigilant and checking in and being like, why isn't my gut working? That kind of thing. Even um, honestly, this war that we wage with microbes, like, oh, yeah. the SIBO is bad and evil and I need to kill it and the microbes are bad and I need to kill the Klebsiella. It's like, these things are naturally a part of you in some way, shape or form. We're never going to get you to a point where you have zero Klebsiella, zero Candida, zero EBV, zero whatever. And that's right. not the goal. The goal is to get it to a manageable level that you can live in symbiosis with. But yeah, it's... Right. Like, it's like the body's the broken. It's like my yeah. body's broken judginess. Yeah. Um, that I Again, think gets people one into job trouble. Kind of energy. Um, yeah. Or like my like my guts just broken. Like I, I think people have that mindset or like oh and I my guts just like this. You know like I have a messed up gut and and well, they get kind of really hyper focused on that and negative energy towards specifically their gut. I just don't know how you're really going to digest well if there's constantly that kind of judgy, shamey nature towards yeah. the the system that you're trying to reboot. Well, and even I'll take it a step further. Sometimes people will say that they don't think they can heal. Yeah. It's like, ooh, okay. <laughs> that's, uh, what is the quote? I, I forget who it's attributed to. Uh, maybe Henry Ford or something, but the quote that you see on the internet is whether you think you can or you can't, either way, you're correct. Right. And I tell people that in FODMAP Freedom pretty early on too. It's like, look, if you're here going through the motions and you don't think I can help you, I probably won't. I could have yeah. the world's best advice and you're sabotaging yourself out the gate. But if you can have at least a piece of your mind be open-minded to changing and changing opinions and actually doing what it takes to heal, I think there's hope for you. And straight up, I ask people in module zero, there's an assessment in the beginning of the program. One of the questions I ask them is, do you think that I'm going to help you? Like, do you think that this was the right choice and this is going to help you? And I had at least one person I could think of in the last group that said, honestly, no. Right. And I'm just, I'm kind of watching and waiting to see what happens with her as the months goes on to see, okay, like, did you overcome the odds? And did you manage to accomplish something anyway? Um, or did you let that get the better of you? Because again, yeah. like, whether you think you can or you can't, either way, you're probably right. Uh, right? Yeah. If again, you think I think your gut is the... broken or right. beyond repair or you're doomed because you have MTHFR, like, yeah, you probably are doomed. Right. But not yeah, because it's, of MTHFR. It's so, it's so tricky. It, it really is. Cause I think like, like we've talked about before, like you get kind of caught in these, like the neurological loops, like your, your brain is used to doing certain things. So it makes yeah. sense that like, oh, your brain's been stuck maybe doing some judgments and some assessments of your gut at all times, kind of like those thoughts are swirling or again, like assessments and judgments of yourself and your decision-making and all that stuff. Um, and, and again, I, I do think it's a practice. I think that, you know, I started really learning more about it during my postpartum journey. Um, I started learning a lot about some self-compassion. And, you know, I think there was more like, you know, judgments postpartum stuff that I was doing that was not helping me in my scenario. And again, I, I haven't necessarily done it really... Um, I would say diligently lately, but I'm always mindful, more mindful of it now if I'm sort of going into a self-critical mode or um, extra judgy mode. But there are like some just really simple, nice, like easy self-compassion practices you can do that help you get out of some of these like negative neurological patterns that I think could be holding you back. And you said that there were some good examples on Kristen Neff's website. So yeah, that's selfcompassion.org. I believe it's yeah. self-compassion.org. Self yep, that's correct. And if you just go to practices, she has guided practices where she leads the, the practice. She has like 15 maybe 
basically, you know, meditations ab- around self-compassion. She has different exercises you can do. I think she might even have like a course, but I would just start out by going there and doing like her self-compassion breaks are five minutes, which I like too. I remember I did them a lot during postpartum and, and there's really three elements and you could do this mentally too. You don't even have to, like once you listen to it, you don't necessarily have to listen to her each time. You could do it in your mind too. But the first element is just acknowledging that you're struggling with something. Like, oh, I'm really struggling with this issue right now. It's really hard. So like you're acknowledging that, you know, you're struggling. The second is that you acknowledge your humanity, which is really just that everybody struggles. Um, It's like a part of the human existence. Some people might struggle with things that other people don't, but we're all kind of struggling with different things. So you kind of acknowledge that like, yeah, everybody struggles. It's No matter what social media tells you, by the way. Right. So that's the second element of self-compassion. And then the third is just giving yourself kindness. Like what, what can you say to yourself in these moments that's like comforting and kind to yourself? And she gives examples, which is really nice. Like sometimes she'll say like, oh, you can use like almost like a pet name. It's like, oh, sweetie, it's going to be okay. Like that kind of stuff. Um, and again, it's been a little while since I've listened, but those are really like the three elements. It's pretty simple. If you listen to her tracks, you can kind of like get in the habit of doing them yourself or you kind of run through of like, oh, what am I struggling? Like, what am I struggling with specifically? You know, acknowledging that everyone struggles and then like, how can you be kind to yourself in the- that moment um, are the things that I would probably try to run through from an exercise standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It's... um Again, I like the imagery of treating yourself as though you were your best friend or your child or your pet, right? Like if, uh, assuming that you're a kind, compassionate, nurturing parent or (laughs) pet owner um, or friend, you know, if, so uh, using an example from earlier, if your best friend in the whole wide world took antibiotics or took a PPI, and had repercussions and a fallout from that, would you go up to your best friend in the whole wide world and be like, wow, you're such a moron. I can't believe you took a PPI. Why didn't you research? What are you doing? You did this to yourself. You gave yourself SIBO, you know. You're going to suffer forever because of this. Like, of course not. And If that was your friend, ditch them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, if if you treated your friend like that, they'd bail on you. Right, exactly. Um, So similarly, uh, assuming that you're a decent human being, you also wouldn't treat a child that way or a pet. You would say something to the effect of, this sucks, but you were doing the best you could with the knowledge and the resources you had available at the time. And I'm here for you. Do you 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 want me to help in some way? Yeah, a hug take, take you out for lunch, whatever it might be, paint your nails. I don't know, but that's how you would treat a friend or your child or your animal. So why don't we treat ourselves that way? Yeah. And I think you can treat yourself that way. I think sometimes it's even helpful. It sounds kind of goofy to talk to your gut that way to be like, Hey girl, what's going on? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Well, maybe not like that. You sound like such a cheese ball, (laughs) but no, you're, you're correct. Actually, I used to do that in a webinar. So (laughs) One of my brain lesions is I'm incapable of doing things short-windedly. So, you know, if you if you register for a free webinar for anybody else, it's like 40 minutes of webinar and maybe a little bit of a Q&A and then they wrap up. My webinars usually go two hours because it's I, like I just keep right. going and there's a lot of Q&A. But um, one of the things I, I've done with webinars is I will start people off with just a little bit of like a guided meditation-y body scan kind of thing yep. and and prompting them to relax different muscle groups or different body parts. And then at the end, I have them put their hands on their tummy and give themselves a hug and talk to their gut and say things like, hey, I love you. You're doing the best you can. I'm going to help you now. We're going to be okay. You got this. And oftentimes in the Zoom chat, people say, oh my God, that was 
amazing or I'm crying. Mm. I yeah. never thought I would cry on a webinar. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a part of the journey, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. Your gut's for not sure. out to get you. Your gut yeah. is a part of you. You have the same goals. And the same thing is true for your immune system or your brain or your skin or your whatever. It's we get so stuck in the suckiness of the symptoms, we don't realize that we're all on the same team. Whether you have 100%. symptoms or not, that doesn't change that. Yeah. It's, yeah. Your gut's just doing the best it can. And, and again, right I, I, I think, you know, even if you look at the research, like we're not just making this stuff up. There's a lot of research coming out on self-compassion. Um, there's a number of things specifically gut related now. Again, you know, you could, like you said, in general, it's going to help the vagus. So that's well established. So anything that's going to help the vagus is really going to help with IBS, SIBO, anything gut related, really. Um, but, you know, even certain studies, there was one study I talked about previously where they used um, mindfulness based stress reduction, and it was basically self compassion. It was like approaching your thoughts and your symptoms in kind of a non judgmental way. And that drastically reduced symptoms. In that particular study, I have another study pulled up. And, and the reason this one I pulled up, it's called Dispositional Mindfulness and Irritable Bowel Syndrome, the Mediating Role of Symptom Interference and Self-Compassion. Um, and it's really interesting. And I haven't, I want to dive a little deeper into it. Um, but essentially, dispositional mindfulness is self-compassion. <laughs> I didn't realize this, uh, that the wording was kind of that way. Um, but it's essentially it's so interesting because it shows, so they talk about symptom interference, basically like how much are the symptoms interfering with life, like day-to-day -day life. Um, and basically what they found in this research article was that, um, let me get to the bottom where they kind of talk about it a little bit more in depth, was that uh, people with increased mindfulness had decreased symptom interference and less psychological distress in the IBS group. So like they were able to do more and they had less distress. So well, go ahead. That I was just going to say that reminds me of maybe it was the hypervigilance episode. It was in an episode we did semi recently. Um, we were talking about this idea that some people will be constipated and not poop for a day mm. and they lose their damn mind. They lose their shit, if you will. But a ba bum. Oh, but they she's actually here all day. don't. Yeah, but they actually don't. That's the problem. But anyway, some people get constipated and don't poop for a day or maybe two, and they lose their ever loving mind. Mm. But I know people in my personal life, my best friend from high school, my best friend, both my best friends from college, also, all three of them poop once a week on average. And if you talk to them, they'd be like, Yeah, I'd love to poop more. That'd be great. But they're living their life. They're out and about. They're not dwelling on it. They're not losing their shit. Again, part of the problem here. But it's you see the exact same symptoms absolutely destroy one person's life mm -hmm. and seemingly barely impact another person's life. And I've seen mm -hmm. that with diarrhea even. I, I remember when I was in the student clinic in grad school, I might have told you this guy, um, I was in the chiropractic clinic. We were just supposed to adjust people and get them on their way. And it, it was just another day in the clinic. And this guy came in and me being the nerd that I am, I asked him, oh, how are your bowel movements? How's your gut health? And he nonchalantly told me, oh, I have diarrhea like 10 times a day, every day, <laughs> half for years. I'm like, whoa, right. okay, we maybe should talk about that, sir. And he's like, no, I just want to get my neck cracked. Right. And, and he just was like, no. Oh whatever. And he went on his merry way after I, I adjusted his neck. So it, it's not to say that you have to suck it up and ignore your symptoms and not to pay attention to symptoms at all. But I do think there's a difference in like how you're handling them and how much it's affecting or ruling your life. And that's very interesting. Maybe part of it has to do with self-compassion. Yeah, they, they, 
the researchers too go on. They say, um, what do they say? Let me read this little excerpt. What do they um, say? Yes. First, mindfulness is, is believed to foster acceptance of one's experience by feeling fully rather than reacting with efforts to change the experience. Such acceptance may improve symptom tolerance consistent with the observation that individuals with higher levels of trait mindfulness in the study had lower levels of symptoms interference and vice versa. Um, so again, like they're basically saying that individuals that could kind of accept that they were dealing with a crappy symptom without trying to kind of like avoid it or change it or get, you know, hyped up about it seem to um, have less uh, impact on their life, essentially. Um, it also talked about how, you know, mindfulness-based interventions are known to reduce illness-related interference in other health populations like chronic pain and cancer, um, which is really interesting, too, because we've talked about sort of the chronic pain connection, um, where, again, it's like the more you're freaked out of pain, usually the more pain you get. It's very analogous to some degree yeah. of IBS symptoms. It's like the more freaked out and scared you are of the symptoms, which, again, we all acknowledge are not good and, and kind of crappy um, to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day level, Um you know, I think we can all agree on that, that it does suck to deal with IBS symptoms. But at the same time, uh, how you're approaching those symptoms day to day and how you're reacting to the symptoms could really change the direction you're going. And I think chronic pain is the same way. Well, and I, I have something related from my personal life, at least, too. Um, this just made me think of labor. Yeah. So you, we all know that there are those women who do like hypnobirthing and they get in the zone and they really harness their mindset and they are able to cope with something excruciating like childbirth. And I, I vividly remember when I had my daughter, um, I, I was just telling some friends this over the weekend, like it was terrible. And part of it is that I was mentally not there. Like yeah. and Nikki was not in the room for a good chunk of that labor. And what was happening was I like there was pain from the, the contraction. And then in between the contraction, I was so terrified of the next contraction right. that it was like, I was extending the misery. So instead of being a bit miserable only during the contractions, I was 10 out of 10 miserable the entire time. Mm -hmm. And I was extending that agony because if I wasn't dealing with acute pain in the moment, I was terrified of the next round of acute pain and I was anticipating it. And it just, it got away from me really quickly. And it was, right. it was a really scary experience. So I get that it could be hard to pull yourself out of this. If you have been living in a world of kind of hypervigilance and anticipating your symptoms and building your life around it and becoming kind of a recluse and, and really like going all in on this world, it could be scary and bizarre to think about getting back out and living your life and interacting with people and trying not to hyper-focus so much. But it's really critical that you do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's an interesting example with the childbirth scenario. Because um, again, it's like it in, a, in the same vein, like you're saying, if if you're like 10 out of 10 scared of symptoms when you're not having symptoms, it's like, okay, you're probably going to that much worse. Right. And again, you're like constantly checking and judging kind of what's happening in the gut and that kind of thing. It, it can be really, really challenging. Um, but yeah, again, I, I think, I think when we talk about acceptance too, I always have to like clarify this too, because they used acceptance in that paper. It's like an acceptance-based practice, really, where you're sort of accepting your situation. And that's not accepting your situation long-term. It's like this is something we discuss a lot in like anxiety OCD circles. You're more accepting your situation in the here and now. So it's like, what's your current situation right now? Is that, man, I had pretty bad diarrhea, which sucked. Um, you know, I've... I'm going to give myself, you know, some time to recover 
and a little bit more rest on the couch when I get home from work today or whatever it is and, um, you know, talk really nice to myself or whatever. Um, but you know, I'm not going to try to like do anything or do any new protocols or keep checking my gut for the remainder of the day. Like I'm not going to do anything to try to change that situation. It just is what it is here and now. Now I think from an IBS standpoint, a lot of the approaches, like I mentioned, are more long term. So like you're not going to change anything day to day typically like this for for most people. Um, you know, it's going to take time to nourish your body. It's going to take time to incorporate different habits that are going to help gut wise. doesn't mean it has to take two years, but like within a day, like span, there's probably not tons you can do to mitigate like, you know, really acute symptoms. You know, there might be a couple little things you can do to take care of yourself, but you know, I, I think that the problem sometimes is like, oh, I got to change everything. I got to pull out of food. I got to add a new supplement because I had these symptoms. I have to do something to change the situation instead of just being like, hey, you know what? I'm on this journey. I'm doing all this things, these things to nourish my body. I'm moving more. I'm trying to get a little more sleep. Like I'm making all these adjustments and they're going to pay off like in the long run, but right now I'm probably going to go through some weirdness and still going to have my symptoms. They're not going to change like the flip of a switch. Yeah. Um, and you know what you reminded me of? I, I don't know how this popped in my head, but somehow this did. Remember in the episode, I think we titled it Bringing Back the Carbs. Remember in mm. that episode, we had this like mic drop moment where we realized the hypocrisy of somebody who's willing to push through the keto flu, mm. but they have faith that the keto diet is the, the be all end all going to heal them best diet ever, despite the fact that they feel like shit for a couple, like a couple days or a week. Right. But like those people are willing to push through the keto flu and feel bad for a long-term goal. But then when they introduce carbs and they immediately feel bad, they use that as a case to demonize carbs. Like, oh, see, I told you carbs were evil and bad. I feel bad when I eat them. Right. It's like, well, yeah, you felt bad when you initially did keto too. Right. That's, you're not proving anything. But it it makes me think of the process of reintroducing foods. And, you know, you can approach that from a standpoint of, I have to be hypervigilant and look for any little itty weedy tiny speck of symptomology. And if I get even 2% more bloated, the food is out. It must be inflammatory. Oh right. my God. Or you could approach this and say, you know what? I haven't eaten carbs in a hot minute and I haven't eaten FODMAPs in a hot minute. Maybe it's going to take some time for my metabolism, my gut, my microbiome, my hormones, et cetera, to acclimate and learn how to metabolize this fuel source. So I'm going to cut myself some freaking slack if I have a slight uptick in symptomology. That, right. that what we taught many episodes ago is kind of a self-compassionate way to introduce foods, don't you think? 100%. I think it's a great example because, again, I think that food in particular um, – is something that people manipulate and like have a short term, I think less, uh, have a short term judgy nature towards. So like, oh man, I reacted to that food that has to come out instead of like, oh, maybe that was a weird day. Like, you know, I, I had a lot going on and I'm just going to kind of keep eating the food and it's not a food thing. Um, or again, like maybe you try the food a number of times and kind of think about it in a way like that. Because again, sometimes there are a few foods that maybe just aren't working for your body and, and that's fair too. But there's there's a way that I think people usually go about doing that in a more self-compassionate way too, where it's like, oh, I'm going to like experiment and be curious and try to do what's curious. best for my body. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I, I have think, one more example. Yeah. If I could cut you off for yeah, a second. for sure. So remember when we interviewed Jessica Brown of The Loving Diet, and we talked about self-compassion in that episode, I believe, too, because that's a big part of her work. I remember her giving a great example where 
So she had a lot of like disordered eating, food theory kind of stuff. And then she has been on this journey of self-compassion and talking to her inner eater and examining her beliefs around food. And in the process of doing that, she said she was really, really delighted to add in all the foods that she didn't eat before. But then over a period of, I think it was probably a couple of years, she said she gradually saw her lip panel move in a direction that she didn't love. And she mm. bas basically, the, the short version of the story is that she came to the realization that she was probably over consuming dairy mm. because she was so excited to have it back and she yeah. wasn't limiting herself anymore. And so she decided to scale back on dairy but it wasn't from a perspective of this is a bad food. It's an inflammatory food. Mm. It's killing me. It's hurting me. Meh. And it wasn't from a perspective of your body's shit broken. Your cholesterol's going up. You piece of garbage. <laughs> it was from a perspective of curiosity. Right. And, and like, oh, that's a trend. And she's, I forget, like a nutritionist or something. Like she's, she knows enough to know that that could be a thing. And she's, experimented with it a bit. And she knows that this is something that for her helps keep her lipid panel looking better. And she loves herself enough. And she values her health and her longevity enough that she's decided to put some sort of limiter on dairy. But again, it's not because she thinks she's broken. And it's not because the food is bad and evil. It's just mm. because she loves herself and she wants to live a long, healthy life. And this is just yeah. one tool to do that. Yeah, 100%. I think, again, the lens of which you're like operating out of is important. And again, can sometimes be a little hard to pinpoint, you know, of like, oh, why am I doing the things I'm doing? Is it because it, it like of a deep seated care for myself? Or is it out of fear? Because I think that that's sort of a, a good distinction to try to make when we're talking about some of these things. Um yeah. And again, I, I think that a lot of people have struggled. I, I don't, self-compassion is not something that's baked into our culture. So, no. <laughs> you know, what's baked into our culture, culture is that productivity matters. Um, you know. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't right. be a sissy. Don't be a baby. Right. I think in that um, definition that I gave, she said like stiff upper lip or something, like just toughen it out or whatever. It's that yep. kind of mentality. Suck it Which up. again, like, you know, there could be a time and place for that to some degree. But I think for most people, they have plenty of that and not nearly enough self-compassion. Um, so again, I, I think that the more you can work on being kind to yourself in various ways. And like I said, Kristen Neff's website, she has an Instagram account I don't think she posts a ton, so her website's probably your best bet. Um, but I know we were talking about, too, I don't want to totally jump over, like, compassion towards others. You know, ways to facilitate that I think is going to be really helpful for Vagal Tone, like you were saying before. Do you feel like you have some good examples that you give people for that? Um, like, as an exercise or little anecdotal stories like the ones that I shared um, I mean, either way, I don't know if you have any, any, uh, additional. Um, yes and no. I think I have one and <laughs> at the risk of revealing some behind the scenes stuff from our world, I guess, um, I, th I find myself thinking about outward otherly compassion quite a bit. Mm. Um, not so much for me, but sometimes I observe this in others. And hmm. I kind of, I see it as like a gauge of where somebody's vagal tone is at. So for example, yeah. um, I'll just, I'll throw out some examples where I thought like, ooh, <laughs> brain lesions or ooh, <laughs> not good vagal tone. Um, so like one, one time, uh, so the, the way that kind of things work with my office is that I have all this info on the website and online and if you want to move forward with working with me, then you would go to my website and fill out like a little questionnaire with a couple of questions. And then we get on for a free discovery call just to make sure it's a good fit. And I think I'm really going to be able to help you. And then we decide if we want to move forward with booking you for an actual 
appointment and, and embarking on the treatment plan. Um, one time I remember a woman called my office and my, like, basically my receptionist was encouraging her to book a discovery call with me and just talk to me directly about something. But she interpreted that as my receptionist was trying to push her toward working with me or something Mm. like she felt like she was being pushed. It's really just because my virtual receptionist doesn't know all of the ins and outs. Like she knows enough that she can talk about my work, but at the end of the day, she's like, just talk to Dr. Deneza herself. No, No harm, no foul doing that. But this person was so fried, they decided to take to the streets and write my business a one star Google review. Yeah. Ranting and raving like a nutcase about how my office practices are this. And I, I'm sitting here and I'm like, dude, I'm literally offering to talk to you for free right. <laughs> to see if this is a good match and answer your questions. And you're losing your mind and attacking me. You've never met me. We've never done business together. You really felt it was appropriate to write a one-star Google review. Wow. So, you know, sometimes I see behavior like this in patients or students or people I interact with in the world. And I am at a point where like internally, mentally, I'm kind of thinking, ooh, not good vagal tone. Ooh. Right. Uh, Like why, why would you treat another human being that way? Um, But yeah, that's probably one that stands out in my mind's eye and probably gave me PTSD because I, I still remember vividly reading that, that Google review and, and, but that lady gave me a gift. Do you want to know what it was? What's that? So first of all, she later took down the Google review, um, uh, presumably because my response appeased her somehow. Um, the gift was that she's the one who made me realize that cold hands and feet, that is a tell for fight or flight mode and stress for me. Mm. I have struggled with cold hands and feet for a long time, not like Raynaud's or anything like that, but generally cold hands and feet. And it's kind of a chronic thing for me. And now I know that when my hands and feet are especially cold, that's probably an indicator that I'm more stressed than I realize. And I only learned that because I popped open my Google business account on my phone. I saw there's a new review and I was like, ooh, because they're usually good, right? right? So I I saw the review thing and I was like, oh, great. And I clicked on it to read the review and instantly my body went into fight or flight mode oh and my hands and feet turned into freaking popsicles immediately. Mm. So, so it was not a fun thing to deal with, but she actually taught me a really valuable thing about my body and my stress response. So, yeah, that's yeah. so... That's so interesting. Um, yeah, I uh, I think, again, it certainly is a good gauge. Sometimes when I hear clients talk about, like, family members or loved ones in particular ways, I'm like, ooh. Yeah, and I think, it, again, like, it's, it, it's probably usually to some degree, too, that their world has become so consumed by the gut health stuff that I just think it disconnects and dysregulates to some degree that even if they're inherently a really compassionate person, it's just not like front of front and center anymore. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's just like a lot of other things in the sense of use it or lose it. Right. Uh, You could start off your life being very compassionate and then you go through something hard and it makes it really, really hard to be compassionate for yourself and others. And you kind of get out of the habit. Um, I will say there's at least one paper um, I, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with the whole paper necessarily. Oh, shoot. Hold on. I lost the thing. Um, one thing I will say too, while you're pulling that up, uh, I feel like, again, I, we, I feel like every podcast we do has a little segment bashing functional medicine, but I will say like functional medicine does not seem like a very self-compassionate, uh, route in a lot of ways because it's very urgent it kind of instills a lot of, um, again, a lot of... Using fear to motivate. Right, fear to motivate, like monitoring things, testing a lot of things, but doesn't necessarily... um, It doesn't... And and then it doesn't promote self-compassionate practices. Outside of maybe being like, oh, you need to do self-care after you eliminate all these foods... And spend all your time and energy like doing this thing. 
which no one typically has. Like a lot of times people are spending so much time and energy on the food piece that they have nothing left for self-compassion. And then that food piece is inherently not very self-compassionate. Hardly. Well, and you got to wonder too, if you have a restricted low fiber diet, that's going to probably decrease vagal tone, right? Because bottom up kind of vagal tone issue. So the diets that people get put on are probably inhibiting vagal tone. That would be a really cool study to do, by the way. And Mm. like measure vagal tone in a group of people and then put them on a hella restrictive diet and see if their vagal tone increases or decreases. That would be cool. But I feel like in order for us to get an accurate gauge, we'd have to have people do restrictive diets with no guidance. (laughs) Probably be an unethical study. Yeah, (laughs) well, yeah, and I'm almost tempted, like, can we monitor a bunch of patients going into a functional clinic? Because I don't think I have it in me to be the practitioner of ranking these recommendations and scaring the Jesus out of people anymore. But um, but yeah, it's, I think using fear as a motivation tool is really not, right. co- not going to foster compassion. Um, honestly, one of the problems with the functional medicine space that doesn't get talked about enough is that each and every functional medicine practitioner is a business owner first and foremost, and there are going to be ethical, good people with good moral compasses who are business people. I'd like to think you and I are like that. But there are a lot of business people who are just desperate for more business, and they will do whatever it takes to get more people in the door. And if that means scaring you or using, you know, fear tactics or Mm -hmm. fancy schmancy protocols and tests and things like that to motivate you, that's what they're going to do. And there's unfortunately a lot of that in functional medicine. But you're right, I think probably the functional and naturopathic community is decreasing compassion in a lot of ways. Um, But I I found the quote that I wanted to share. Yeah, please. Um, So in this article, they, they made a point of saying that both state and trait compassion, so that means like induced and dispositional compassion, were associated with increased vagal tone and increased vagal control of the heart. They said this result has relevant clinical implication pointing to the fact that the positive consequences of compassion on the body can be achieved through practice, training, and therapeutic interventions, such as compassion-focused therapy aimed at cultivating compassion both for oneself and others. So that's huge. If you're sitting there at home thinking, oh my God, this is going to be a nightmare. I know damn well I'm not very self or otherwise compassionate what the heck do I do? And you're thinking, oh, Amy and Nikki must have just been compassionate wizards from birth. And that's why they've got it so easy. It it can be practiced, it can be honed in. And again, Kristen Neff's resources at self-compassion.org could be a really good way to start working that muscle a little bit. But mm-hmm. like any muscle, again, metaphorical in this case, like any muscle, you can't just go from being a couch potato to doing 50 squats with 5,000 pounds. You have to start with a couple of body weight squats. Then you graduate to the little five pound dumbbells. Then you graduate to the 10 pound dumbbells. Like you really have to work the muscle, so to speak, frequently enough and diligently enough that it becomes part of your life again. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Let me look real quick. Just looking through one or two more other things. Here, this I thought that this was one one more good little quotable quote to share. Um, in this paper, they pointed out that the same brain regions that have been associated with better heart rate variability, which is a measurement for vagal tone, also constitute the neurological basis of compassion. Mm. So when you look at the brain at its function and you do something like an MRI, and you look at the areas of the brain that light up, the parts of the nervous system that give you better vagal tone happen to be the parts that light up when you are compassionate. So yeah, so it's so interesting. It, it makes me think, you know, from a compassion standpoint, it helps make your body feel safe. 
And, and yeah. again, I think inherently that's going to help your nervous system in so many ways too. Well, here we are talking about the vagus nerve, right? And that is rest and digest. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get into that mode unless you feel safe enough to rest and safe mm -hmm. enough to digest. So right. safety comes first. And you're right. I think which scenario would you feel safer in a scenario where you mess up a bit and you get shamed and judged and like the finger wagging at you or when you mess up and somebody says, you know what, it's going to be okay. You goofed happens to everybody. It's no big. We're going to move on from this and you're going to recover and it'll be okay. Uh, obviously the latter is going to feel a lot safer. Yeah. One last thing I'll say, it kind of brought, brought it up. I, I think perfectionism is highly linked to like not being self-compassionate. And again, well, it's like this idea. Opposite. Right. It's not, I, I think again, perfectionism is basically thinking you can't make mistakes. And like, so you usually are going to have like an exaggerated stress response if you make a mistake. Um, and I think as a perfectionist, I think that there's a lot of judgment that comes from that side of things. So if you tend to swing more towards perfectionism, I think you probably are also someone that needs to work on self-compassion. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. And I'll bring up one more point because I know we're getting towards the end of your window of availability here. Um, there, when I went through uh, Jessica Brown's loving diet practitioner program, there was a part that I thought was, was good to point out. So she pointed out that in research, like, again, this is bona fide stuff. Self-compassion reduces disordered eating, reduces feelings of shame, might even boost or modulate the immune system, which is wicked cool. It decreases the fear of failure, like food reintro. Right. Oh my God, that is huge for our people. And it makes people more accountable, not less accountable. And I just wanted to close this out with this idea because sometimes people hear self-compassion and they think, oh, you're just cutting yourself some slack and you're letting right. yourself off the hook. Like, oh, it's okay that you didn't finish that major project because there's no consequences and you're, you're still fine and great slugger. That's not what I'm saying. It's you still need to like live your life and get shit done. I get that. But if you are practicing self-compassion, it actually makes you more accountable and presumably more productive rather than less. And it's probably because you're not wasting a bunch of your time and energy with that mental loop and freaking yourself right. out and shaming yourself for no reason. Like that takes time and energy and resources and that's taking away from what else you could be doing. So I just, I wanted to throw that out there that this whole episode was not just about like letting yourself off the hook or letting other people off right. the hook. That's kind of a whole different, a whole different ball of wax to get into. But I certainly hope that we made the case for self-compassion in this episode. Amy, do you think we did? I think we did. Who knows? I think, I think we'll we did. Have to, the, we'll have to let us know if we didn't. <laughs> Somebody in the I don't YouTube know if we'll do well. anything about it, but well, yeah, touche. <laughs> but uh, but you know, you could share your opinion certainly. And uh, similar to the last episode, just briefly, I wanted to share if you'll indulge me in my 10 second commercial. FODMAP Freedom is open this week. We're closing the doors midnight on Thursday. So if you listen to this episode the week that it drops, you can join. Um, go to www.fodmapfreedom.com backslash enroll, E-N-R-O-L-L. -L, and there will be all sorts of information, answers to most of your questions you might have about the program and a link to book a call with a FODMAP Freedom Coach if you have any more questions or want to connect with a human being and decide if this is the right path for you. But I'm super excited to lead more students through this journey very much in module four and just writing the ship and getting people pooping like champions and feeling better. So come check out FODMAP Freedom if that sounds like something you would like to pursue. And until then, we will see you right back here for the next episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. So toodaloo.